Somewhat early in 5th edition D&D, Wizards of the Coast tested the waters to see if they could sell very small booklets containing just a single playable race. Rather than include the little poison frog person as a logical addition to Tomb of Annihilation, they instead decided to try and sell them as a four-page booklet called One Grung Above. They couldn't, as it turns out. And barely anybody has played a grung as a result, which is a real shame because these colorful frogs are a wonderfully flavorful addition to the D&D roster. So if this is the kind of character you're thinking of playing, I highly recommend you stick around for today's episode. For a lot of adventurers, all they'll really know is that grungs are the little aggressive frog-like humanoids shooting arrows at them found in tropical jungles. But assuming you're not killed or enslaved, there's an interesting if murderous culture to be found in between the rivets and stabbings. Grungs are tree-dwelling poison dart frog people who aggressively defend their territories and their sacred breeding pools from the inferior, as they would put it, outsiders who might encroach on their land. Grung tribes are also into enslaving such inferior creatures, and some tribes even go out on raiding parties to capture more slaves, which they keep docile and working through minor poison doses. The grungs have a strict caste system based on their bright colors. When grungs hatch, they start off as a greenish-brown, then the colors of their cast come in as they reach adulthood, which takes about a year. Through special ritual magic and herbal treatments, grungs can even change color and join higher echelons of their class society, but few grungs receive this elevated grung honor. Green grungs are the lowest class, acting as basic laborers, hunters, and they'll fill out the rank-and-file bottom rung of the grung warriors. A green grung tribe member is the most likely to defect since they're on the bottom of the pecking order, and they're the most commonly encountered type of grung. Blue grungs are one step above the green, typically working as artisans or watching the young. The blue grungs are the least combative of the castes, and you're probably not likely to encounter a blue grung on the outskirts of grung territory. And then supervising the blue and green grungs are the purple grungs, the managerial and administrative caste. Each purple grung commands soldiers, sees to the laws, and generally keeps the society working. And above the purple grung are the red grungs, who are always either scholars or magic users. Red grungs keep the tribe's histories and perform auguries for their sovereign. And above the red grungs are the orange grungs, the elite warriors and chief commanders in leadership positions second only to the royal caste. Most orange grungs work directly with their tribe's sovereign, and it's not uncommon to see an orange grung in charge of large parts of the tribe's territory. And then at the top, of course, we have the golden grungs, who are the absolute ruling caste of the grung society and are the rarest of grung kind. Every tribe's sovereign is always a gold grung, and they are rarely seen outside of their treetop palaces. Palaces. The Grungs were released quite a while ago, before lineages were a thing, so they've got the classic racial stats. This means they have specific ability score bonuses, and there are certain classes that will work best for them. So let's go through each of those and see what's all in line for your character. Grungs have a plus two bonus to dexterity and a plus one bonus to constitution. These are both physical ability scores, strongly pushing you towards a martial class build. Fighters, rogues, rangers, and monks would all be excellent classes to play as a grung. When it comes to age, grungs mature to adulthood in a single year, but have been known to live up to 50 years. Adulthood in a single year is more than a little unusual, which means you could have some fun playing around with your fully adult character who's actually only a few years old. Other than that curiosity, there's not much to say. That's a lie. There's a lot to say about that, but um, I will leave that up to your guys' individual groups. When it comes to alignment, most grungs are lawful, having been raised in a strict caste system. They tend toward evil as well, coming from a culture where social advancement occurs rarely, and most often because another member of your army has died and there is no one else of that caste to fill the vacancy. This is one of the first stumbling blocks for making a grung character, as from a base D&D lore perspective, most grungs are pretty evil. Most grungs' first reaction to spotting non-grungs is to kill or enslave them, so running off to be a grung adventurer is pretty unlikely when you take that lore into account. Most grung characters will be best served as exiles who have fled grung society in some way. But, you know, if you just want to say screw it to all that and just make a good grung character that was raised by good people or something, I say go for it. With Arboreal Alertness, you have proficiency in the Perception skill. Free skill proficiencies are always welcome, and Perception is arguably the best one to get, so check that box and feel free to take more options elsewhere. 
When it comes to size, grunks stand between two and a half and three and a half feet tall and average about 30 pounds. Your size is small and you're basically gnome size, but the difference between small and medium in 5e doesn't amount to a whole lot. You're locked out of some really big melee weapons and making a great grappling build, but since you're getting a big dexterity bonus, you're better served by ranged weapons or finesse weapons anyway. Your base walking speed is 25 feet and your climbing speed is 25 feet. Yes, you have a climbing speed and moving at 25 is pretty standard for small races. Uh, so having that 25 climb speed is a very welcome bonus. Yes, you biology nerds, you are indeed amphibious. You can breathe air and water, no holding your breath, no time limit. You're just straight up chill underwater, which is weird since actual poison dart frogs aren't that way, but oh well. Note though that you aren't getting a swim speed here, just the ability to breathe down there. This usually means that you can scout out underwater stuff with ease, but avoid combat down there since you'll be pretty slow. As a grung, you are straight up immune to poison damage and the poison condition. Straight up immunity is... it's rare for players, and poison is fairly common as far as damage types go. Speaking of poison, let's talk about poisonous skin. Grung poison is their most interesting and unique feature, but it has some major problems. At first glance, essentially having unlimited extra damage poison to apply onto weapons and a basically free chance to poison a melee combatant looks amazing. The problem is that neither the DC of your poison ability or the damage caused by it really scales. This means that at very early levels, poison skin is fantastic. Your first to third level players are going to love it, but it barely matters at all at later levels. DC 12 is a very easy DC to pass, and practically every monster past challenge rating 7 or so will almost always succeed. This throws a weird weight onto Grungs, where they're much better picks if you know the campaign will only last for low levels, and a bad race option for higher level campaigns. Well, maybe not bad, it's just this ability is not going to come in as hot as it would at lower levels. Though I will say, for you role-playing heavy kind of parties out there, I'm sure you will come up with all sorts of interesting ways to incorporate this into your storytelling. So don't let the mechanical effects of this talk down how interesting this could make your character. Something I really love about the Grung is Standing Leap. Your long jump is up to 25 feet and your high jump is up to 15 feet, with or without a running start. And if you become a certain type of monk, this could definitely go up, but that's maybe a discussion for another day. Anyway, as a frog, you've got those jumpy legs, and while it's a bit odd that you get this in the form of a flat distance rather than bonuses, it's still a welcome ability. A 25-foot long jump and a 15-foot high jump are equivalents of a strength 25 character's jumping ability, which... <laughs> And then we get to the biggest stumbling block of this type of character that stops most people from playing Grungs. At least, this seems like the thing that would stop most people from playing Grungs. Assuming you aren't in a wet environment, you're basically going to need constant access to water. This isn't impossible to deal with, but depending on the situation, it can be incredibly inconvenient. An ally carrying a big water barrel is one option, or you may need to make your Grung a spellcaster specifically for the Create or Destroy Water spell, or get it using the Magic Initiate feat. Otherwise, you can literally die if you go so much as a few hours without a bath. But then again, who's going to make a character and not know the kind of terrain that they're going to at least be starting in? And if you DMs out there are going to throw your grung players into a desert, like, <laughs> go to hell. <laughs> and then finally, for languages, you can speak, read, and write grung. Yes, as one last stumbling block for grung players, you don't speak common, at least at first. The xenophobic grungs don't bother to learn languages other than their own, so you'll need to select a background that offers languages and select common if you want to be able to talk to your fellow party members. All this does is open you up to some great chances to build an interesting and unique backstory that lines you up with your character build, but it is, on paper, very, very funny. Admittedly, I have only had one grung come across my game table, but it was a pretty fantastic character brought to life by my brother's equally incredible dedication to role-playing, and just all these fun quirks that come with the race. While the grung definitely come with some mechanical hurdles, I believe it's all intentionally done in service of creating a unique character that you can engage with. The jumping ability comes at the expense of water dependence, for instance, but these are things that instantly force the DM and the players to think outside the box. So I hope some of you guys pick up the Grung for your next character, as I highly recommend it. 
Guppy the Gurp Druid. I look forward to our next Miyazaki-esque adventure together. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Be sure to like and subscribe because we put out new videos like this every week. And if you guys are going to be making a grown character, I would love to hear about it down in the comments. Thanks again for watching. My name is Patrick Ferguson from Skull Splitter Dice, and until next time, farewell.